course, the year of Israel's founding. And the, uh, the, the focus of the story is a tiny unit of the pre-state militia called the Palmach, which was uh, founded under the British mandate, founded actually with British involvement, and um, uh, morphed eventually into what we know today as the Israel Defense Forces and the Israeli intelligence community. At the moment that the story takes place, it's maybe the pivotal moment of the 20th century as far as the Jewish people are concerned. It's the end of 1947, November 29th, 1947, the United Nations votes to partition the British Mandate Territory of Palestine into two states, one for Jews and one for Arabs. And of course, that's a story that's familiar to, to many of us. And what ensues is, is a war. The war lasts about a year with a few uh, ricochets that continue into uh, 1949. And the, uh, the story of the 1948 war, I think, is fairly well known. People know about the Haganah and the Palmach and the central battles of that war. But what I stumbled onto here was a story that I had never heard before, even though I consider myself to be fairly well read in Israeli history. And that's the story of a small unit of very young Jewish men, all of them immigrants to Israel from Arab countries, so Jews native to the Arab world, who showed up in Palestine in pre-state Israel um, in the 1940s and find their way into what becomes the nucleus of Israeli intelligence, although of course no one knew it at the time. So that's the, the setting for this story, this very fraught moment uh, in 1948 at uh, the very end of 1947 until the spring of 1949, but the, the 1948 war. Uh, thanks, Mati. I'm still getting used to the uh, technology. So um, tell us a little bit about the, the main characters. Who were they? Where did they come from? How did they arrive in Israel? Well, I think that when we, when we picture the state of Israel at that time, and I think when some observers of Israel from outside Israel picture Israel today, what people are imagining is a European Jewish society, mostly Eastern European. The uh, early ideologues of Zionism are, of course, Europeans, and we're all familiar with Theodor Herzl and the story of, of Zionism as it's usually told. So it's Herzl in Vienna and pogroms in Europe, socialism, the kibbutz idea, the Holocaust, of course, and, uh, and that is very much the story of Israel's founding as we know it. Uh, the, the population of uh, the Jewish Yishuv, the pre-state Jewish community in, in Israel at the time, is about 90% uh, of European descent, mainly Eastern European descent. But there's a very small minority of Jews who come to Israel from elsewhere in the Middle East. And the Arab section, the unit at the center of this story, is made up of those Jews. So I chose four characters to concentrate on in order to have a very kind of focused story that would hold people's attention. I chose four characters who were central to the main episodes in the war, as far as the Arab section was concerned, and also characters who left behind enough writing and, uh, and records for me to be able to piece together their lives at the time. In one case, one of them was actually still alive and I could, and I could interview him. So one uh, was a Jew who came from Aleppo, Syria, the son of a very ancient Jewish community in the city of Aleppo, which has become famous, of course, in, in recent years for all the worst possible reasons uh, because of the Syrian civil war. Aleppo was home to an ancient Jewish community, one of the world's oldest. Another one of the four is also a Syrian from the other big Jewish community in Syria, Damascus. A third came to Israel as a child from Yemen. And the fourth was actually born in British Mandate Palestine, but born in Jerusalem in an Arabic speaking neighborhood. Uh, his friends growing up were Jews who spoke Arabic and Arabs who of course spoke Arabic. So we have four native Arabic speakers. None of them had ever been to Europe or anywhere near Europe. They had a Jewish story and a Zionist story, which was very, very deep, but very different from the one that was common to most of the Jews in Israel at that time, certainly to the leadership, the Zionist leadership, which came from Eastern Europe, came very much from the world of Yiddish, 
and the world of, uh, of Jewish Europe, these were very different people and they came from some, somewhere that was different and they brought with them a very different way of seeing Israel and seeing the region. And that I thought was what would make their stories so different and interesting. And uh, what was the security situation at the time in Israel? And why did they feel that they had to send spies into, uh, into Arab countries? Um, what benefit were, were these spies giving to the, to the Jewish community in Israel at the time? So it's important to remember when we talk about 1947, 1948, that no one knew what was going to happen. It's such an obvious thing to say, but we all assume that Israel was going to be created and that the course of history as we know it uh, was obvious. But of, of course, no one knew that at the time. And the situation at the end of 1947 and the beginning of 1948 is extremely precarious. And it looks for a time as if the Jews are going to lose. And in fact, the chief of the British general staff believes that the Arabs are going to prevail in the war. And that was a, a logical assumption. The military weight of the Arab world was greater than anything that the Jews were going to be able to put together. And it seemed pretty clear to many observers at the beginning that the Jews were going to lose. And the Jews in Palestine knew that losing that war meant obliteration. There was no, it wasn't going to be some kind of friendly peace treaty and everyone was going to move on. It was a war of life, uh, of life or death for the Jews in Palestine. And it seemed at the very beginning that, um, that a loss in the war was quite, was quite likely. And one thing that the Jews lacked, along with many other things that they lacked at the beginning, like weapons and an organized military and a really good idea of how to fight a war, which of course the Jews had never done or hadn't done for about 2,000 years. One thing that they lacked was intelligence. They didn't understand the Arab world very well. And that had to do with the fact that most of the Jews who were in pre-state Israel and in British Mandate Palestine couldn't speak Arabic and they'd come from somewhere completely different. They would they'd come from Poland and Russia and in some cases from Western Europe, places like Germany, but very few of them were conversant in Arabic or had a very clear picture of Islam or the Arab world. And there was a real disconnect between uh, the Jewish community here and, and their Arab neighbors, certainly uh, Arab residents of neighboring states. So the Jewish military apparatus needed people who could cross the line and figure out what was happening on the other side of the line and report back what is going on in the Arab neighborhoods of Haifa. How many people live in this Arab village? Who is the, the most powerful family in this village? Who do we need to speak to if we want to strike a deal with someone? What is the size of the local militia in this Arab village or that Arab village? They needed some way to get that information. And the way they, uh, the, the, the tool that they come up with is the Arab section, which is a very small unit of about, it's about a dozen guys at the beginning of the war in 1948, that's it about 12 guys, who, uh, of whom about half survived the war. So the work was extremely perilous, and, uh, and several of them don't, uh, don't make it. Um, and, 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 and the rest of them do, and manage to bring back very useful intelligence, which is some of the only intelligence that the Jewish side has to work with throughout the entire war. I see. And... Um... They they obviously were there in the Arab world during the war of uh, 1948. Can you tell us a little bit about the adventures that they, that they went through there during those times and what kind of intelligence did they bring back and in what tangible way did they help uh, the Jewish community in Israel at the time? Sure, and uh, um, maybe we can also show some pictures uh, which might help to illustrate the, uh, just the way, these, the way they looked and the whole um, kind of aesthetics of the time, which I think people will find very very interesting. Um, we have one picture here of, um, if you can see it, it is a picture of two of the spies, two of the Arab section spies. One of them is Isaac Shoshan, who is in the foreground and in the, uh, in the, uh, on the far side of, of the car that you can see in the picture is another spy named Havakuk Kohen. Isaac Shoshan came to Israel from Aleppo and Habakkuk in the back came from Yemen. They start off by uh, with kind of more minor activities. So they're crossing into the Arab part of Haifa. They're dressing up as workers. They're kind of trying to pick up, talk in cafes and conversations and read newspapers and, and report back about what they're, 
uh, what they're hearing, and then they graduate to more complicated and dangerous operations. They, uh, they carry out an assassination or an attempted assassination of one of the main Arab military leaders in Haifa. They bomb a garage where an Arab militia is preparing a truck bomb that is supposed to uh, explode at a, at a Jewish movie theater in Haifa. Uh, and they kind of graduate uh, to more and more complicated missions until April 1948, which is the central moment of the, of the war that year. There's a battle in Haifa. Haifa is the main port of British Mandate Palestine. It's a very important city. It's split half-half Jews and Arabs, and it's the, uh, it's the only port. So everyone understands that they have to control Haifa. And the, the decisive battle happens in Haifa at the uh, end of April 1948. The Haganah, which is the uh, kind of... Uh, uh, early incarnation of the Israel Defense Forces wins the battle. There's a wave of refugees, of Arab refugees, who flee Haifa to Lebanon. And the Palmach, which is part of the, the, the pre state militia apparatus, understands that the, the, the wave of refugees leaving Haifa is an opportunity to get Israel's first spies into the Arab world. And I have to remind you that at the time, there is no Israel. So if the state of Israel is founded in May 1948, we're still in April when the first sections of the, uh, when the first agents of the Arab section are dispatched to Lebanon, including Isaac and Habakkuk, who you see in, in the picture. They uh, reach Lebanon before the founding of the state of Israel. And in fact, they don't even know that the state of Israel has been founded until weeks after it happens because all they know is what they're reading in Arabic newspapers in Lebanon. In the picture on your screen, you see another one of the spies whose name is Yakuba Cohen. He's dressed in the uniform of an Arab militiaman. Yakuba has a, 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 a kind of a wild and fascinating story of his own. He was the most um, kind of energetic, brave, perhaps reckless of, of the four main characters. So the spies end up in Lebanon and they uh, are posing as Palestinian refugees from the war. And they end up spending the first two years of Israel's existence in. Lebanon as Palestinian refugees. And if you understand who these people are, who the spies are, there's something fascinating and moving and very confusing about their story. These are Jewish refugees from Arab countries who are pretending to be Arab refugees from a Jewish country. And there's so much confusion and identity blurriness in their story that you miss a lot if you just call them Israeli spies. When they reach Lebanon, they're not Israelis. There is no Israel. No one's ever used the word Israelis. What they are is something much more complicated. And that is what's really interesting to me in, in their story and in this book, Spies of No Country. I see. And so, as you mentioned, they were refugees who then pretended to be refugees on the other side, essentially where they came from. And um, what, how did they deal with this conflict of identity, um, having to pretend to be Arabs when they actually are Arabs, but with a different identity, Jewish identity? And you get this very fascinating dynamic between the two. Right. So that, that's something that was very interesting to me in this book. Who, who are these people? Who are they? We have this tendency today to speak about Jewish and Arab as if that, there's a very clear line running between those two, uh, those two groups. But there were many, many Jews who were native to the Arab world for, for centuries. In fact, the Jews in cities like Aleppo or Damascus or Baghdad, they, th those communities predated the arrival of Arabs in places like Aleppo. The Jews had been in Aleppo for about a millennium before, uh, before Islam. So uh, we have this native population that speaks Arabic, that adopts Arabic language and culture after the Arab conquest in the seventh century CE. And, um, uh, uh, but, they're, but they're Jews, they're, they're distinct. They, uh, they do not consider themselves Arabs. Their, their Arab neighbors don't consider, them, don't consider them to be Arabs for the, for the most part. And they arrive in Israel. And in Israel pre-state, in British Mandate Palestine, they were strange. They couldn't assimilate. In, properly into the, the, the Zionist mainstream because they were too different. The European Zionists had their own story and they didn't know what to make of these strange people who came from places like Aleppo, who came from places like Baghdad and seemed to the European Zionists like Arabs. They spoke Arabic and they seemed a bit too close to the enemy and that made their own situation in their new society precarious. And what happens is that 
these characters, my four characters and a very small number of others, realize that their Arab identities can actually be a weapon in the service of the Zionist movement because the Zionist movement needs spies. It needs people who, who can understand the other side. And, and in that very small corner of the Zionist movement, these people become useful and their identities, their Arabness, which is a disadvantage in the society at large, becomes an advantage and it becomes kind of a ticket into the holy of holies of the Zionist movement, which is the Palmach, the elite of the pre-state militia. So they're taken to a camp, they're picked up on different kibbutzim and kind of on the fringes of Zionist society in that time. A lot of them are street kids, orphans. These are people on the margins of society and they're taken to a tent encampment where they are trained to be spies. And uh, the question is, what is it exactly happening at this encampment? What are they being trained to be? Are they being trained to pose as Arabs? Well, all of them speak native Arabic and their native culture is, is Arab. They don't need to be taught to speak Arabic or to blend in, uh, in, in Arab society. They do need to be taught Islam because they're Jews. They don't know anything about Islam. They've never read the Quran but they, uh, their Arab identities aren't really a, a pretense. So the question is, is it a pretense that they are Arabs or is it a pretense that they are not Arabs? Are they people who are pretending to be Arabs or are they people who are pretending not to be Arabs and then pretending again to be Arabs? It's all very confusing and fascinating. And again, that's a big part of what I'm interested in in the story of these four men. So I can't help, but this story really reminds, uh, uh, kind of like echoes the Ellie Cohen story. So I, I'm sure quite a few in our audience have uh, watched the, um, the documentary uh, with Sasha Baron Cohen on Netflix um, about Ellie Cohen. And it's a similar story of a, someone who came out of the Arab world, moved to Israel, and then used his expertise in Arab culture and, and language to then uh, spy on the other side. Um, and in terms of this, conflict of identity, how do you think this reflects in modern uh, Israeli society, this conflict of identity between Mizrahim and Ashkenazim and how you contribute to the state either way? It's a great, it's a great question and I'm glad that you brought up the Eli Cohen story, which is such a, it's a famous story here and that, and, and the series which I actually I wrote a review of, I was very, I was positively uh, su surprised, pleasantly surprised by, by this series, which I didn't expect to be very good. And then I thought that ultimately it actually did have something interesting to say. It wasn't perhaps, you know, the masterpiece about Eli Cohen that we need, but it was an interesting series that made, that made some good points. The story of these spies, whether it's Eli Cohen or whether it's my spies, who are a generation before Eli Cohen. So Eli Cohen is hung in Damascus in 1965. These spies, the ones I'm writing about, are active in 1948 but there are direct connections between the Arab section and the Eli Cohen story. Eli Cohen is very much a, a descendant, if you will, of the Arab section. The brain behind the Arab section is an Iraqi Jew named Shimon Somech, who everyone calls Sam'an. Everyone knows him by his, uh, his Arabic name. And it's Sam'an who runs Eli Cohen. So the same people are involved in, two, uh, in, in both of the, of the cases. What it, what is interesting about these spy stories is that they allow us a window into Israeli society. So of course, everyone loves spy stories and you know, subterfuge and double identity and you know, anyone who's read Le Carré, they, these stories are irresistible. But the added uh, interest in these stories is what they say about Israeli society. And there's an interesting scene from the Eli Cohen series, uh, which I thought, I thought Sasha Baron Cohen did a, a, a wonderful job with Cohen's character. And he, there's a scene in that series, which you might remember if you've seen it, where uh, at the very beginning, uh, Eli Cohen and his wife Nadia are at a party at the very ostentatious, kind of opulent house of, of uh, uh, an upper class Ashkenazi Israeli. And there's a pool, and it's all very fancy, and nothing like that existed in, 19, in, in Israel in 1960. It's, a, it's an utter fantasy, but they're trying to make a point. Uh, the, the, the host turns to Eli Cohen, who's a guest at the party, and asks him to bring him a drink because he thinks Eli Cohen is the waiter because he's a dark-skinned Mizrahi Jew. So he must be the service staff. And afterwards, Eli Cohen and Nadia are back at their apartment and Eli Cohen says, you know, when they look at me, they see an Arab. You know, they might know that I'm a Jew, but they see, they see an Arab. So that being that was a disadvantage in Israeli society at that time, a, a real disability. And it was something to be overcome. The only place in the society where it was an advantage was the intelligence world where they needed people like Eli Cohen or like my spies to cross, to cross the lines. 
And this is not a, a marginal story in the state of Israel. If you know anything about the demographics of the state of Israel, I'm a, uh, uh, of the Jewish majority in Israel, about half of the, of the Jews in Israel have roots in Europe, mostly Eastern Europe, and about half have roots in the Islamic world, mainly in Arab countries. So it's not like there's a small community of Jews from the Islamic world in Israel. It's fully half of the Israeli Jewish population, maybe more, there's some argument about the numbers, but it's about, it's about half. So if you understand that um, Israelis today are the children and grandchildren of these people, people like Eli Cohen, people like the spies in my book, people whose identities were blurry between, uh, the, the, the blurry between their Jewish identity and their Arab culture and language, uh, they wouldn't have considered themselves Arab, but they, their culture and their language was, uh, was Arabic. And then you understand something very deep about, about the state of Israel, which is often described both by its admirers and by its detractors as a European implant in the Middle East, but which is in fact a largely Middle Eastern country in its, in its demographics. If you uh, take the 20% uh, Arab Israeli minority, plus the half of the Jewish majority that is of Middle Eastern descent, um, then you have a solidly Middle Eastern country. And that's not the way people tend to think of it, although it's come more and more to the fore in Israel in recent years. You can't understand much about Israel unless you understand the Middle Eastern character of, of the country, the pop music, the way Israelis see Judaism, what Israelis eat. If you come to Israel expecting Jewish food as a North American might imagine Jewish food, uh, you won't find much of it. Uh, there's not very much, by the way, of bagels here. People eat North African food and Levantine food, and that's not because they've adopted local culture, uh, or not just because they've adopted local culture, it's because the Jews here came from the Islamic world, and that fact very much shapes the country. So the country has a secret identity. The country presents itself as European and thinks of itself as European, but it, it actually isn't as European as it thinks. And the, spy, the story of these spies is a way to get at that. Uh, I'm just looking at the screen here and seeing the photograph that you put up. This is the tragic side of the Arab section. So uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, there are about a dozen agents in the Arab section at the beginning of the, of the war. Half of them make it and half of them don't. And these are two of the agents who don't. Uh, Ezra and Dahoud, they are dispatched at the height of the fighting across Egyptian lines into Gaza. So the spies at the center of my story are sent north into Lebanon, but some other spies are sent south across Egyptian lines and they're caught. Uh, many of these guys were caught. Their cover stories were very flimsy. They'd never been trained. It's a completely amateur ad hoc operation. There's no spy school. It's not MI6. It's something, you know, very, very, uh, it's kind of a seat of the pants operation. They're caught. Their covers are blown immediately. They're photographed. They're even filmed. And then they're shot in Gaza and their bodies are never found. And that's the fate of about half of the spies in the Arab section. So the, uh, the, what you mentioned about the Israelis being half from uh, Arab and Middle Eastern Islamic countries origin, I guess that kind of like answers the question that we get sometimes about, uh, you know, the falafel being culturally appropriated in Israel from the Arab lands, when in fact, as we can see in this spy story, um, it is actually a, uh, Israel society is actually comprised of people who have actually come from the Arab world and share a big part of their culture uh, with the Arab neighbors. Um, uh, on how did you in general come across this story and why did you think it was important to bring this story to the fore? But in part it was, uh, in part it's because it's just a fascinating story and because I think that that's really the missing link for people trying to understand Israel. People are still, people in the West are still kind of, they're telling the same stories about Israel that we've been hearing for many, many years. The Six Day War, Golda Meir, Moshe Dayan, David Ben Gurion, these are all great and important stories, but they don't have that much to teach us about Israel in 2020. Israel in 2020 makes a lot more sense in the context of the Middle East than it does in the context of European Zionism in the first half of the 20th century. And for many Jews in the West, it's a hard leap to make. It's hard to go from that great story that we all know, which is common to the story of our grandparents and great-grandparents, if your roots are Ashkenazi, and, and leap into something that's completely strange. Jews from Aleppo, Jews from Damascus, Baghdad, Yemen, what <laughs> Arabic speaking Jews, what is this? Uh, but we have to make that leap if we're gonna understand Israel. And I saw this story as a way to help make that leap. The second part of it was to address what you 
uh, what you just said, which is that there is an, an attempt to erase this history. And it's being made in an interesting way, both by us, ourselves, and by our, by our uh, Arab neighbors and, uh, and opponents. The, the, um, the idea that Israel is a European country can be found in the earliest Zionist propaganda posters. We've all seen the posters of the blonde pioneer who's hoeing the fields and uh, listening to Beethoven at night you know, on the kibbutz. And that was a very powerful uh, uh, image. It was the image that Israel wanted, but it was never, it was never really true. Uh, and if you uh, look at the, at the Arab world or at representations of Israel in the Arab world, you'll often see a depiction of Israel as, of Israelis as crusaders or European colonialists. If you've ever been to Cairo, there's a painting of the greatest moment in Egyptian military history, which is the crossing of the Suez Canal on Yom Kippur 1973. It's this huge kind of socialist realism mural, and it portrays Israeli soldiers who are falling captive, begging for their lives, being kind of uh, uh, vanquished by heroic Egyptians. And if you look at the depiction of the Israelis in the painting, they're blonde. The Israeli soldiers are blonde. Now, if you've ever seen an, a real Israeli military unit, you know that the Israelis are not blonde. And in fact, Israeli soldiers, a lot of them look a lot like Egyptians. And in fact, if you looked at the soldiers on the Suez Canal in 1973, a lot of the Israeli soldiers, or at least some of them, were Egyptians. Some of the Israeli soldiers were Egyptians because there were 80,000 Jews in Egypt until the 40s and everyone left and most of them came, came to Israel. And that is a very uncomfortable fact for the Arab world because it raises a lot of questions about the ethnic cleansing of Jews in the Islamic world, which is evident to anyone who visits an Arab city like Cairo, walks around downtown Cairo and realizes that a big chunk of downtown Cairo is called the Jewish Quarter. Where are the Jews? Where did everyone go? Same thing in Casablanca, same thing in Baghdad, Aleppo, Damascus, Sana'a, you name it. Where did everyone go? That's a, and what happened to their property? These are uncomfortable questions for the Arab world. And it's much easier to pretend that the Israelis are all blonde, that they all came from Europe, that when Israelis eat Middle Eastern food, they're stealing Arab cuisine, and not that they brought it with them from Aleppo, which uh, is where they're from and where Jews were actually, uh, where Jews actually predate Arabs by about a thousand years. So this is all uh, too complicated and it's, it's much better to make it all go away. So speaking of Aleppo and the Jews being from, uh, from Arab countries, you've recently written a, a new book about the ancient Bible manuscript, the Aleppo Codex, which can be viewed in the Israeli Museum in Jerusalem, which is the oldest um, uh, existing uh, uh, book, the oldest existing written Bible that we have. Um, and so what is the connection between your books and, and your journalism? Because it seems like there is a theme that links all of these things together. Thank you for that question. There, I've written three books so far. One is the Aleppo Codex, which is about the, as you said, the oldest and most accurate copy of the Bible in Hebrew, which is also, also called the Aleppo Codex. My second book is called Pumpkin Flowers, and it's about an obscure military outpost in a war in Lebanon that I stumbled into as a Canadian moving to Israel in the 1990s. So it's partly a memoir and partly a history. And the third book is this book about the Arab section and, and, and Israel's first spies. And I think what I'm trying to, to do in these books is, although I wouldn't have known to explain this uh, at first, but I'm trying to use little known and very focused stories from the margins of people's attention to make a big point about Israel. So rather than telling a macro history of Israel, a sweeping history of Israel, I take something very, very small and try to plumb its depths to see what it can tell us about our lives here in this country where I've lived for 25 years, a country that I'm still trying to figure out uh, you know, uh, a quarter century after, after coming. So the, 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 the general theme, I would say, of, of much of what I've been trying to do is to try to access the Middle Eastern side of Israel, to get away from those easy European stories which were powerful and, and true and uh, in the first part of Israel's existence, but which are no longer very helpful in understanding Israel today. And I think that there's a, a growing disconnect between Israel and the diaspora, and that's just uh, 
um, natural almost, you know, the, 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 the populations are diverging as generations go by. Jews in Western countries like the UK or like the United States are becoming more and more Western. Jews in Israel and the Middle East are becoming more and more Middle Eastern. That's, that's natural, but it's making communication more and more difficult. And when, one small contrib contribution that I can make is to enable better understanding uh, for people looking at Israel from the West. And if you're coming at Israel with these uh, old stories about the kibbutz, about the pioneers, about socialism, you're gonna be frustrated when you actually encounter the country when you land you know, at Ben Gurion Airport, which of course you can't do now anyway. Um, but if you could land at Ben Gurion Airport and walk out into the, uh, the actual country and try to navigate it, if you're trying to navigate it with stories about Herzl and Ahad Am and A.D. Gordon and all of the great lights of early Zionism, you're not gonna get very far. But if you understand what Judaism in Aleppo was, or if you, stand, if you understand what Kurdish Jews are, then Israel makes a lot of sense. Israel makes sense in its context. If you've been to Alexandria or Beirut and then you come to Israel, it, it makes sense. It's not a group of European Jews who happen to be thrown into the Middle East. What it actually is, is a Middle Eastern Jewish country or a hybrid of, Europe, of the remnants of the European Jewish world and the Jewish, the very old Jewish world of, of the Middle East. So what's happening here in reality is something much more complicated than what Israel's founders envisioned. Um, I think maybe better than what Israel's founders envisioned, but it's something that requires us to, uh, or requires Western observers to understand something that's foreign to them. It's very interesting. So indeed, kind of like focusing on the Arab and Middle Eastern roots of Israel is, can, can actually be used as a great tool to counter some of the attacks that Israel is facing these days uh, in the West. Um, that Israel is not a foreign uh, entity on its land, and that actually its culture and identity is rooted in, in, in exactly that same place where it is located. And so that could help us actually to counter anti-Israel arguments that are being voiced here in the UK and elsewhere um, uh, quite often these days. Um, so that's going to lead to uh, the, the Q&A that, that we've got a few questions that have been asked on the chat. And uh, the first one is from Jonathan Hoffman, and he's asking if there is a testimony from this Mizrahim regarding the reasons for the departure of Arabs in the early, day to, in the early days of the state. So they were in Haifa, they were in the Gaza, so they must have been involved in the, in the uh, Arab discussion there about the war, about the war aims, and about where they were going to go in case they lose, etc. So how do these things play? Thank you for that question. There's a fascinating testimony, which I quote at length in the book, from one of the agents, Habakkuk, who, if you remember the picture from the car, Habakkuk was the one who was sitting in the, in the passenger's seat. He is planted in Haifa, at the port in Haifa as an Arab worker. And he lives there for months before the 1948 war, working in the port. And the idea is for him to develop a, uh, an identity, develop a cover, and kind of get the pulse of uh, the Arab side of things in, in Palestine, which, about which the Jews know very, very little. And Habakkuk is planted for two periods, each period of several months. And he writes intelligence reports, which are utterly fascinating. And he seems to have been something of an anthropologist or maybe a journalist. Much of, most of the information is in military. So he's on the lookout for some military uh, bits and pieces, but there, he doesn't seem to come up with very much, but he can tell you what Arab workers at the port ate for lunch. They eat pizza and tomato and onion. He uh, picks up on what movies people are watching in Haifa, uh, where the young workers at the port hang out in the evenings. Uh, where they're from. Many of the workers uh, uh, at the port and many of the Arab, uh, many Arab residents of Haifa aren't from Haifa. They come from Syria and uh, elsewhere in the Middle East, and they've been drawn by the economic boom around the port. So who are these people? And he writes uh, fascinating reports, which culminate in a document that, in my opinion, is the most interesting document I've ever seen from the 1948 war, which is an account of the last days of Arab Haifa. Uh, there's a catastrophe, as far as the Arab side is concerned, in Haifa in April 1948, the British are pulling out. There's an attempt by the Arab militia to attack. The Jews uh, uh, counterattack for the first time using tactics that resemble the tactics of an actual army. Haganah starts maneuvering like a real army. Uh, this is uh, uh, the end of April 1948, so a few, a few weeks before the state is founded. There's a battle in Haifa that lasts about two days. The Haganah wins the battle and it triggers a massive flight 
from Haifa because no one knows what's going to happen. People are worried about what the Jewish forces are going to do. There are attempts by the Jewish mayor of Haifa to get the Arab residents of Haifa to stay because he doesn't want them to leave. But people are uh, terrified and understandably so, and they end up running away to Lebanon. And Habakkuk, who is with them using Arab cover, experiences all of this from the Arab side. And he manages to get back across the lines, which is very dangerous. He gets shot through his hat. He has a bullet hole in his hat uh, as he's crossing back uh, across the, the line, but he manages to get back across the lines and he files an intelligence report that recounts all of this. And it's one of the only uh, uh, accounts from any side that we have from someone on the ground. And it's quite tragic and it's quite sad and it's utterly fascinating if you understand who's telling you this story. So I quote that at length in the book and it's a it's of great interest in my in my opinion this isn't someone who's looking at the arab side through the sight of a sniper rifle he's with them and he is a jew and he's very much committed to the to the zionist cause but he has deep sympathy for the people who he's living with and that char that characterizes the arab section these guys are not ideologues they're humanists to a man and that makes their account of the war i think very very valuable and, and interesting Thank you. Uh, Richard is asking, um, who was in charge of recruiting those agents? So um, you've mentioned uh, the Palmach, but who were the characters involved in coming up with this idea uh, and actually recruiting them? And also, were there any female spies? That's, th those are two great questions. I'll start with the last one. The, there, there are initially a few women who are brought into the Arab section because the people running the section in the early 1940s, so years before the 1948 war, understand that if you send single men into the Arab world, they're going to draw attention. And the way to uh, deal with this is to have female agents accompany them, but it's very difficult to find uh, uh, young women from Middle Eastern Jewish families who are, whose parents are willing to let them embark on an adventure like this with men who they're uh, not related to or not married to. Uh, several women do join up. Most of them are from Yemeni families, and I do mention them a bit in the book, but in the end, they're not used. The beginning of the Arab section, this is good for a British audience, the beginning of the Arab section is actually in the Special Operations Executive, the SOE, the British SOE, which is dispatched across the various theaters of World War II uh, to wreak havoc behind enemy lines. And people know the stories of the SOE in Europe, and it's one of the great, you know, uh, war yarns of the, uh, of the British uh, uh, war effort. Churchill tells them to set Europe ablaze. I think I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but there's a quote like that. Um, and, th and there's a contingent of them in the Middle East. And they, they have a problem in the Arab world, which is that the Arab uh, world is largely on the German side. And people don't like the British because Britain is a colonial power in the Middle East. And they've antagonized, antagonized a lot of the uh, Muslims in the Middle East who throw in their lot with the German side. So it's hard for them to get uh, reliable agents. But the contingent in British Mandate Palestine realizes that in Palestine they have people who can help because there are Jews in Palestine and the Jews of course are completely loyal to the Allied cause. There's no question about them having sympathies for the, for the Nazis. There are Jews in Palestine who can pass as Arabs. They're among the first to realize that this is actually useful, that there are people who can actually be of use. So the British and the Palmach uh, the SOE arrives in Palestine and the Palmach is set up almost at precisely the same moment in 1941, which is a moment of extreme panic in Palestine because it looks like the Wehrmacht is about to capture Palestine. The Afrika Corps is coming through North Africa and the, the Germans are coming down through the Caucasus and it, things look bad. It looks like the British are about to lose the war. The Americans aren't in the war yet and everyone's desperate and the Jews in Palestine understand that if the Germans capture Palestine, it's going to be a catastrophe. So they put aside their differences of opinion with the British mandate, of which there are many, particularly the restriction of Jewish immigration, Jews desperate to flee the Nazis are not being allowed into Palestine by the British, but the Jews say, okay, we'll put that aside and we'll join forces with the British. And that leads to the creation of a few military units, uh, one of which is the Arab section. Another unit is the German section, which is a similar idea. The British SOE realizes that there are Jews in Palestine who can pass as Germans because they're German Jews. So they set up a unit which is meant to operate behind German lines once the Germans occupy Palestine. And they're trained, according to their testimony, they're trained in Wehrmacht uniforms. They're trained to sing Nazi songs. 
uh, they're uh, trained to pass in every respect as Wehrmacht soldiers in the event of a Nazi conquest of Palestine. In the end, of course, the Nazis are turned back at El Alamein by the British and the German section is not necessary, but the Jewish leadership realizes that they'd better keep the Arab section because one day they know there's going to be a war with the Arab world and people who can cross the lines and report on the Arab world are going to be useful. So even after the Jewish-British cooperation uh, falls apart and they go back to hating each other again, the Arab section, which was really kind of a bastard child of the British Empire and the Jewish national movement, is maintained and it eventually comes to play a very important role in the 1948 war and then goes on to become the Mossad. Uh, so it's a very uh, uh, kind of a, a seed pl planted by British adventurers and aristocrats and various eccentrics uh, who are the people who populate the SOE. Um, and it uh, still lives on today in the whole kind of world we know as Israeli intelligence. It's very interesting. And that actually answers the next question that we have, uh, we've been asked by Charles Jenkins about a number of Jews in Mandate Palestine that worked alongside and with the British intelligence uh, organizations, including uh, Kai Merzog, who later became the first president of Israel. And um, Charles is asking uh, how much tradition and tradecraft was inherited from these sources. So do you want to elaborate a, li a little bit on that? or? Sure. Um, it, there wasn't the, the, they didn't have much, by the way, of tradecraft by the books of it. If you see in the book, they're really making it up as they go along. These are not trained uh, agents. There are the original agents trained by the British, trained by the SOE in 1941. But my agents come into the Arab section a few years later, once the British are no longer in the picture. Uh, Sam'an, who I mentioned, the Iraqi Jew, who's really the brain behind the Arab section, is trained by the British, and he seems to have been something of an Anglophile. He's from Baghdad. The Jews, many of the Jews in Baghdad, were very much uh, Anglophiles. They, of course, there, there had been a British colonial presence in Iraq. Many of them had been educated in British schools. He was a middle class, uh, a son of a middle class family, and he had an English library. And he uh, learned tradecraft from the SOE and then transmitted it to the uh, to the Arab section. So there is a line that connects the uh, the SOE guys and the, the Arab section, but by the time of the 1948 war, it's a few, a few generations have passed in the Arab section, and they're very much not James Bond-like characters or anything resembling you know, the, the suave spies of the British imagination. These are working class guys who are running a kiosk in Beirut. They're selling newspapers and sandwiches. They're, you know, they have ideas about sabotage, uh, some of which pan out and many of which don't, uh, but they're not the... Um, they're not attending you know, high class dinner parties and bring in valuable diplomatic information. There's something, uh, there's something different, uh, but they, they do have that part of their DNA comes from the SOE, the way they make bombs. There are certain ideas they have about sabotage. For example, one of the agents, Yakuba, who you saw wearing the, the uniform of an Arab militia, his dream in Lebanon is to blow up the refinery in Tripoli. There's a very important installation at Tripoli, Lebanon, uh, and he wants to blow it up. The idea of blowing up the refinery in Tripoli is an SOE idea from 1941. And in fact, the first Palmach operation, the first big operation uh, in 1941 is an attempt to blow up the, uh, the refinery in Tripoli. The, 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 it ends in tragedy. A boat uh, sails from British Mandate Palestine with a group of uh, Jewish militiamen and one British officer. And they head out into the Mediterranean on their way to blow up the refinery in Tripoli and, and vanish. The boat, which is called the Sea Lion, vanishes and is never heard from again. But that idea lives on in the Arab section. So there are interesting echoes of that time. It's very interesting because it actually reminds of the uh, Lavon affair of 1954, in which uh, uh, a few Mossad agents, the Israel, this apparently has been approved by Yitzhak Lavon, who was one of the ministers in the Israeli government. And uh, these guys were sent to Egypt uh, trying to create, uh, to sabotage um, Egyptian facilities and they were caught and hanged in 1954. So it seems like the tradition uh, kept going from the, from the uh, Arab section into uh, the more modern Israeli intelligence agencies. Um, would you be able to elaborate a little bit on, the tra on, on that transition? So when did the Arab section end and moved into the Mossad the way we know it today? How did it go? When, when was it dismantled? And how did the process go? There's an interesting line that is crossed in the, in the Lavon affair, which shows kind of part of that, or maybe something problematic about that transition, 
the Arab section always had instructions not to make contact or not to make use of the local Jewish community. There are Jews living in Beirut at the time that these Israeli spies are in Beirut. And they have an explicit instruction not to make any use of the local Jews so that they're not incriminated in Zionist intelligence activity. Of course, there's growing hostility to the Jewish communities that are native to the Arab world in those years. It will end uh, within a very short period of time in tragedy as these communities are eradicated uh, uh, and, and expelled functionally. Uh, and the Arab section is quite careful, not entirely careful, and I mentioned that in the book, but, but quite careful, and that's the instruction. The Lavon affair is a, a moment where Israeli intelligence ignores that rule. And they make use of native Cairo Jews, native Jews from Egypt, in uh, a, a misguided attempt to provoke Egypt and play a very complicated game that's supposed to provoke an Egyptian response and or provoke an, uh, a, a response by the Western powers thinking that uh, their interests are being threatened in Egypt. It's a, a terrible idea and it ends tragically. Uh, people are hanged, as you mentioned, people are imprisoned and it ends up further incriminating the Jews who are native to the Arab world as Zionist spies, as Israeli spies, which by the way is an idea that continues to this day, um, which um, is not, only the fault of the state of Israel, but Israel exacerbates it with adventures like the, uh, like the Lavon affair. The, the Arab section continues its operations until the spring of 1950. So the state is founded in, in the spring of 1948. There's an army, there's an, uh, an intelligence corps that's set up. Uh, the only part of the Palmach, which is the pre-state militia, this kind of very chaotic, socialist, pro-Soviet, uh, uh, anti-hierarchy pre-state militia, the last section of the Palmach to function is the Arab section because these guys are in Lebanon. They can't be disbanded <laughs> because they're not in Israel and they are in Lebanon until the spring of 1950. So when they come back to Israel, they're extracted using rubber dinghies from the, the, the beach in Beirut and they come back to Israel, but it's actually not back to Israel because they've never been to Israel. They left Israel in April, 1948. The state is founded uh, in May. So they've actually never been in this country that they supposedly serve, and they are officially part of the Israel Defense Forces Intelligence Corps, but they've never met anyone from the Israel Defense Forces. And they're officially Israelis, but they've never, you know, they've never been in this state. So they come back. And when they return to Israel, that's the last section of the Palmach that's dismantled, and they are subsumed, most of them, the surviving members, into what is now Israeli intelligence, which eventually gets split up into a few different arms. There's military intelligence, there's the Shin Bet, which does internal security, and there's the Mossad, which does external intelligence, foreign uh, intelligence gathering. And most of the ex-members of the Arab section find their way into the, uh, into the ranks of Israeli intelligence and end up having very interesting careers as, uh, as the years go on. Uh, uh, some of their adventures still haven't been told, their later adventures, because at, at least one of them was Israel's longest serving undercover spy. That's Gamli El Cohen, one of the four, who lived for years and years in Europe under Arab cover. Or his cover was so deep that he had two daughters born under cover identities and they did not know they were Jews until they came back to Israel. I met one of his daughters who I'm in touch with, whose name is Nira. That's a Hebrew name, of course. Mira is a Hebrew name, but she was born with the name Samira. Samira is an Arabic name, and she was given an Arabic name that could be easily changed back to Hebrew once the mission was over and the family returned to Israel. So these guys have very interesting careers. It doesn't end with the Arab section, but it begins there. So it sounds like there were a bunch of really very interesting uh, characters. Christina is asking, if you could be one of the spies that you researched, which one would you be and why? Huh. I don't think I would have the, the courage uh, uh, to be any of these guys, to be honest. They, you know, they venture into this utterly chaotic and dangerous moment in 1948 with nothing behind them. They're not, they don't make a salary. They, there's no intelligence body behind them. So if you're spying for MI6 or for the CIA, you know that there's an office somewhere where someone knows you know, where you are and who you are. And, these guys have nothing. There is no Mossad. There is no state. They go off in April 1948 without a state behind them. And they have no idea that one is going to be created. We assume that they know that because we know that it happened, but they had no idea. So the, the courage involved in their mission is really astounding. And I would like to think that I would have been one of them, 
but I have a feeling that I that I wouldn't. If I had to, I, if I had to choose, or if I you know could wish myself into the shoes of one of them, it would be Chavakuk Cohen, who I mentioned uh, as the agent who spent months undercover in high funds. Uh, if you read his intelligence reports, and and I quote them again at length in the book, he had a real human touch, and these spies had the ability, which I really respect, to be loyal to the Jewish cause. They understood that the Jews needed a state. They understood that this was absolutely a necessity and that no one was going to hand it to them and that they were going to have to fight for it and maybe would have to fight for it forever. They knew that and they associated themselves with that and they were willing to die for it. But at the same time, they maintained a deep sympathy for the other side and a, a human approach to the other side. And they never made a monolith of the other side. And their attempt was always to understand the other side, not just so that they could be defeated, but so that you know, some kind of better reality could be created for this new Jewish enclave in the Middle East. So I, I love Habakkuk's take on things. And I think his human, his humanistic or his anthropological approach to intelligence is, is wonderful. And it's not at all what you'd expect from, from a spy who's looking for, you know, the number of tanks or the number of weapons or a certain diplomatic or, or uh, decisions of state. He wants to know what people are watching in the movie theaters and what they're eating for lunch. And I love, and I love those details. And I love that approach. Interesting. Um, Joe is asking, how do they get their information back to Israel? So you mentioned, you, men you mentioned that they were kind of like, it was quite a, um, a primitive uh, spying system. And how would they communicate back with the office? It, it's a great question. They go off to, to Lebanon in April 1948 with no way of communicating. Israeli intelligence in, nine, in April 1948 does not own a radio. Uh, at the beginning of their mission, Israeli intelligence does not own a camera. So when they go off to photograph Syrian military fortifications in early 1948, they have to borrow a camera from someone who they know who has a camera, which is a very rare uh, thing in Israel at that time. So they go off to Lebanon with no way of communicating, and, and, and they're basically told, just go. We're, we're going to figure it out. Don't worry. There's a saying in Hebrew, which some of you might know, which is, yebesedem. It will be okay. Things will be okay. Don't worry. Just go. They're sent off into the Arab world with no way of reporting back. And they arrive in, in, in Beirut with no way of reporting information back to their headquarters and no way of knowing what's going on in Israel. So when the state is founded a few weeks after they arrive in Beirut, they don't know. And they only know what they see in Arabic newspapers, which is that the Egyptian army is approaching Tel Aviv and the Iraqis are crossing the border over the Jordan and that everything looks very dire for, for the Jews. And it takes them a while before they smuggle in a radio. Someone smuggles a radio, a Morse kit, into Beirut, hidden inside an ordinary radio, a big wooden radio of the kind that would be familiar from the 1940s. So it looks like a regular radio inside. There's a Morse kit. They rent an apartment on the roof, a one-room apartment on the roof of an apartment building in, uh, in Beirut. And they begin, they hide their uh, antenna as a clothesline. They hang their underwear on the clothesline, but it's actually their antenna. And they begin to tap out Morse messages in the summer of 1948. And I've seen the transmissions. Someone was sitting in Israel at this desk, which you can see in the photograph. This is the headquarters of Israeli intelligence around the time of the War of Independence. So if you're picturing, you know, a skyscraper with satellite dishes on, on the roof, this is a shed in a kibbutz called Givata Shlosha. You know, you can see it's a table, you know, the, it's some very primitive uh, arrangement and they're broadcasting to this, uh, to this radio and, and, and someone's writing down the transmissions in a, in a handwriting with a pencil. And I've seen the files. They were just declassified for me by the Israeli military archive. And it's quite astonishing to, uh, see the primitive beginnings of this, uh, what we now think of as being a very kind of uh, impressive uh, intelligence apparatus. It had very humble beginnings. Very interesting. Um, and so the final question would be from Barbara. She's asking um, if there's any exhibition currently in the Palmach Museum in Israel about the Arab section. And I guess I would add to that, to what extent is the Arab section and the contribution of these spies and uh, known in Israel these days? And how much is the government involved in this? Unfortunately, the Arab section is very little known. There were two books published about them in Hebrew years ago. Both are out of print and neither were widely read. People who know about the Palmach, scholars of that time, have heard of the Arab section, of course, but the average Israeli has not. 
Uh, the book was actually just published in Hebrew. It came out about a month and a half ago in Israel. Terrible timing, just as all the bookstores closed and there was absolutely no way to get any books. Uh, it might be freeing up now. Uh, so I hope that now that the book's out in Hebrew, there'll be renewed interest in what is, in my mind, one of the most interesting stories of 1948 and a very interesting window into the country we have now. If you go to the Palmach Museum, which I'm glad that you, you mentioned it, it's a kind of a fascinating place, uh, and you go through their regular exhibit, uh, you will see that they've, uh, they kind of take you through the history of the Palmach using a, an imaginary unit of Palmach fighters, men and women, the Palmach was mixed, and one of the fighters in this fictional unit that they've created, kind of using, uh, they, uh, uh, it's kind of a video, uh, kind of a video exhibit where fighters from the Palmach tell you parts of their, of their story. One of the men is supposed to be from the Arab section. And um, so there's an acknowledgement of it, but it's not considered central to the story of the Palmach. And I'm in touch with the people at the Palmach Museum who are very interested in this book. And hopefully after the Corona quarantine ends, uh, there's going to be an event at, at the Palmach Museum, and we're going to try to get these guys some uh, some belated attention. They should be much more famous than they are. Mati, thank you very much for joining us today. This was fascinating. Um, that's the end of the webinar. We don't have uh, any more time, although I'm sure this conversation could go on uh, for, for hours long. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone who joined us. Thank and you so much for having me. Thanks to everyone who asked the question. Sure. Have a great day. Bye-bye.